Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our afternoon keynote. I'm here with Mark Ganzi, CEO of Colony Capital and Digital Colony. And Mark, thanks so much for doing this. It's been a while since we've seen each other, but I'm really, really happy to have you here. Thanks, Rich. Um, you're, I don't know many friends I can say that uh, have been friendships that have lasted three decades in, uh, in, our, in our various uh, journeys that we've had together in real estate and telecom together. It's been a lot of fun, a lot of fun and it's been great to call you a friend and um, you're, you're one of the great, great legends in our space. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. Great. Thank you so much. It's nice of you to say. And uh, Mark, I tell you, you've, uh, you've done a remarkable amount of things in your career. And now you're the CEO of this, you know, multi-billion dollar entity. Um, so um, you just transitioned to the, into the new role as CEO at Colony Capital. How is it different? How's it changed from what you've been doing up to now? Is it drastically different or pretty much the same formula? You know, it's, it's really interesting. People ask me all the time, they say, what's it like being a public company CEO? And it must be such a huge departure from what you did before. And I tell them, look, it's, it's really not that different because I haven't changed. My management style hasn't changed. Um, as you know, a lot of the people that have worked with me for the last 20 plus years are still with me. And the, the formula is, is pretty simple for me. It's about just sound leadership, which is bring really good and competent people around you, um, empower them, respect them, be transparent with them. And if you create that kind of culture, it doesn't matter if you're running a 20 person private company, Rich, that's doing SIDAC, or whether you're running a multi-billion dollar, you know, diversified global uh, real estate investment trust, the same principles for effective management really ride in every CEO. And there's a lot of books that'll tell you that. You don't have to be, you know, an Ivy Tower guy. You don't have to be from, you know, from, from Jack Welch's school of, you know, of coming up through the GE ranks, you just need to have a really good moral compass at the end of the day and really understand how to treat people and, and, and bring good people around you. And so that part of the journey has kind of been the same. Uh, there really hasn't been much has changed. I'm still the same guy. I'm still leading the same way I lead. Yes, it's a bigger organization. It's more, there's a little bit more complexity given some of the commercial real estate we have, plus all the digital real estate we have. And, um, and yeah, I was, I was asked to come in and complete a very difficult job, which was to figure out how to take a you know, $50 billion global asset manager and convert it into a $50 billion plus you know, global digital real estate manager. So in a very short period of three years, I'll have been responsible for rotating $100 billion of assets. And um, that, that's, that's kind of a new challenge. Yeah, that's, that, one, that one's been a little bit different. Um, I'll say. But uh, you know what? I'm still having fun. Uh, I wake up still every day at 5 a.m. Nothing's changed. Um, still working seven days a week, still having a lot of fun, you know, keeping the culture, you know, light and, uh, and making sure that, you know, the old, the old uh, premise of the three G's that you met in the early nineties of, you know, Ginsburg, Gansey and Gelman work hard, play hard. That adage still holds true. And you, you got to make sure you really enjoy the journey with the people you're with rich, you know, this from building so many great companies you got to have respect and you got to, you got to want to fight for each other. And once you build that kind of culture, anything's really possible. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things, Mark, and going back and looking at the magazine piece we did about a year ago was that you've been so consistent in what you said, you're not talking about, and I've read the stuff you you're out in some interviews you've done, but you said the same thing to me a year ago about what you were looking to do. And it's a remarkable how you've been able to stay on course with that and not vary. So one of the things that we, we talked about in the magazine article was that um, you saw yourself as a real estate player, not just a telecom tower operator. And now you've kind of made sure that everybody knows that this is digital real estate. So um, how's that morphed into the notion of, you know, going, taking the look at the assets you've got now getting rid of the ones that weren't contiguous with the digital piece and looking at now a focus completely on the digital assets in the company. Well, look, the, 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 the real success formula is focus. That's a lot of what you saw in that when we had that chat last year, it's just wake up every day, have clarity around what you're doing. Don't confuse the mission. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in 
when you get into the chair, you look at all your surroundings, you create the mission, you create the people that are mission capable, you create the processes to get you there. And then you just wake up every day, you put your hard hat on and you just go to work. It's like, it's not that hard. And, and, you know, people that wake up with clarity and focus and mission and the people capable of executing the mission, there's never any confusion about what we're doing. And so when we merged our business with Colony Capital last year, um, my partner, Ben and I, we'd spent, you know, probably six months architecting that transaction. But by the time it closed in July, we had a, we had a battle plan. And look, I, I wasn't, you know, I had to wait a year to be the CEO, but behind the scenes, I was making critical, you know, decisions and changes with our then current CEO, who then said, look, we've got to accelerate this. We've got to put you in the CEO chair quicker. You, you clearly have a handle on everything and, and you can be effective at it. So the, the, the key to the colony story was there, there were just four simple things we had to do. It wasn't really terribly hard. You know, one, I had to delever the company which was a, a real priority for me. You've known me a long time. I don't like to over gear businesses. You know, those of us that were around in the late nineties and early two thousands and watched all the tower companies go bankrupt or near bankruptcy. We all learned a valuable lesson in digital infrastructure, digital real estate, Rich, which is you over gear these businesses, eventually they'll choke. So, you know, we want to set ourselves up for a multi-decade path of success at Colony. And to do that, I had to rewrite, you know, how the company thought about corporate leverage. So I took it from 12 times down to 7.8 times target leverage next year at about five and a half to six times. And then ultimately I'd like to be at about four and a half times with an investment grade rating, following a playbook that's worked really well for American Tower, you know, SBA, Digital Realty, Equinix, folks that have achieved an investment grade rating in their debt. Second thing we had to do was just right size the cost structure. And, you know, one would say, oh, if you're running a 40, I think we're 47 billion or 48 billion today, global asset manager, you need 27 offices, you need 500 people. And I said, time out. No, you don't. <laughs> Let's figure out what people are doing. What are the functions? Are they making us money? Do you know, are they saving us money? And so we put the business over the last year through a rigorous amount of, you know, just testing and, and pulling and, and pushing on the GNA. And where we've ended up today is we're at about 11 offices today. We're about 240 people. When I got here, we were 500 people, 28 or 29 offices. So we've cut down our number of offices. I'd like to get that down about six or seven globally. And ultimately, we'll, we'll probably be at about 150 to 160 people. By the way, managing the same level of assets, higher revenues, higher EBITDA, but doing it with you know one third of the GNA. So we've saved our investors about almost 100 million of run rate GNA. Wow. We think there's another. We're guiding folks to another 40 to 50 million of GNA next year in savings. And if you think about where you know these digital REITs trade as a multiple of EBITDA. Even if we're at the bottom of our peer group at like 11 or 12 times EBITDA right now, and we've done a good job recovering the multiple in the last three to four months, but if we're at 11 to 12 times EBITDA, look, you take $100 million of cost out of the business, you're creating a billion two in shareholder value or billion four, depending on your multiple. So by pulling you know, this initial 100 of, of cost out and another 150, we think that ultimately where our multiple will trade, we'll create $2 billion of shareholder value just by running businesses the way I've run them in the past. Once again, don't recreate yourself. You don't need to be something that you're not. Just be what you are. Just adapt and make sure that you, you keep your, your same frame of reference on how you run a business, whether it's 20 people or 500 people, but be true to yourself. And, and if you stick to your guns, you'll be able to execute your cost structure. And third thing we promised to folks is that we would sell assets. And we've been doing that. Um, we've, we've sold over 18 billion of assets since I got here. Um, big, big trades, and, and we'll sell a couple of billion dollars worth of real estate uh, over the next couple of quarters. Um, that'll generate fantastic net proceeds. And now we're in a great position. We have over $900 million of cash at our discretion. And once again, when I got here, we didn't have that kind of liquidity position, but I've really rotated the business to, to a very positive liquidity position. I delevered the business, and now we can play offense. And that's kind of what we're doing now. The last leg of the stool is growth. And we're, we're growing this business the way we've grown other businesses, which is one, you got to do it organically and two, you got to do it through M&A. So, you know, we did the data bank acquisition on our balance sheet. We did the Vantage Yield Co. acquisition on our balance sheet. We acquired Z Colo. We acquired a big chunk of edge presence, which I'm excited about. And then on the other side, we, we manage third party capital for others, Rich. So we've got 16 companies in our investment management business, 16 amazing businesses. 
um, where we, we manage billions of capital for other people, where we get fee and carry. So we get, quote unquote, we get paid for ideas. But we put, we put our own capital into every deal, just like we always have. And we allow shareholders to invest in, in that journey with us. And um, that's where we've created a lot of value. Because as we raise new third-party capital, which we've done this year, and we generate more fees, of course, as you can see what happened in the third quarter this year at Colony, we grew revenues 89% rich in our digital segment quarter over quarter. Wow. And we grew EBITDA by 102% from the second quarter to the third quarter. So we're making profound movements uh, as a digital REIT. There hasn't been another digital REIT that's grown like that quarter to quarter. I can't remember the last time. You'd have to go back to the tower companies in the early 2000s. So we're making progress. Um, we're having fun. It's, you know, there's more hard work ahead. We're, we're not done yet. We've got another, you know, call it another 20, 22 ish, 23 billion of real estate assets to rotate out of. We've got about 25 billion of digital assets today. You know, 55% of our assets are now digital, 45% are traditional real estate. And um, the good news is all that hard work I did at Wharton uh, studying real estate under Peter Lindemann has worked out because I still have to manage a, a big portfolio of medical assets. We've got 400 wellness infrastructure assets. We've got a big mortgage REIT, and we've still got about 36 private equity uh, real estate and debt investments in the original colony, you know, private equity and uh, debt real estate funds. So it's still, there's still a lot ahead of us, but man, we've made this business a lot simpler and uh, something that investors now can get their minds wrapped around. So let's focus on focus. So you are um, talking about digital real estate all the time. And that basically, what are, you know, they fall into four categories, I guess, towers, fiber, data centers, and uh, small cells, other, um, you know, that cover it pretty much. Yeah. Those are so, the, we, we call those the four swim lanes. Gotcha. So the beauty of what you're doing, though, it seems like you're looking at these businesses as how each one intertwines. Well, they're all standalone potentially, but um, one can can help the other and they can um, benefit the other. So in other words, Extinet can help Vertical Bridge and, um, you know, the other, the data center piece can be valuable to all the companies. How does that work in your head in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with that? Well, look, the, the connective tissue is really the digital colony brand, you know, which, which is the manager of those 16 companies. So we've got a global investment team of 77 professionals, Rich, from Singapore to London, New York, Boca Raton, Los Angeles, that manages all these assets on a global basis. And so typically we've got four to five people on each investment. So take, for example, um, let's use Databank, right? Edge computing business. Proforma with Zcolo, 66 edge data centers, um, big national footprint. And if a customer comes to us, like recently we've worked with a, a logo called Moby TV. What's Moby TV? It's, you know, providing, you know, uh, full TV services on, uh, you know, on, on smartphones for 5G and, and really sort of being a disruptive force for cable. And when we met with those guys, they said, look, we, we need, we need fiber. We need, we need edge data centers. We need to get closer to the ecosystem that T-Mobile has because they've got a partnership with T-Mobile. And we said, look, no problem. We, we took one of our senior people in our investment team. We said, look, help us think through how we put Moby TV, not just in a data bank's data centers, but how do we get them connected with Zayos Fiber? How do we think about pulling them closer into the CRAN hubs that we manage for T-Mobile at XNet? And now we can sit down with a customer like that, Rich, and have a sort of 360 view of their network infrastructure. And that those conversations, you know, are now happening with people like Dish. Um, that's a great customer, you know, T-Mobile, which is touching a lot of our infrastructure. So there are customers that work across our ecosystem. And when it comes time to do something big, whether it's a launch of 5G or it's a de novo launch of a brand new network, we want to bring all of those companies to bear on that logo. The idea is to work with the customer and to leverage our infrastructure so that we can lower their cost. And that's the key. If a, if a customer can come to us in an incredibly efficient way and get their, you know, their data center presence and their fiber presence figured out in one shot, then we're really adding value for the customer. Not just adding value for the three portfolio companies that are the beneficiary, but really the, the way we look at it is 
we're adding value for the customer. And that's, that's where we're starting to hit our stride now because we have so much infrastructure that we can sit with a customer and have these kind of very, very 50,000 foot strategic discussions like, okay, how do we build this network for you faster, cheaper, and how do you get on air quicker, right? Um, if you can figure that out for a customer, they're going to come back yeah. and they'll keep leasing space from you. It's like any real estate business, right? I mean, if, if the reality is, if look, if, if Ernst & Young has a great experience with Boston properties and they had that experience in Boston and then they go to New York City and say, oh, well, we had a good experience with Boston properties. I want to go back and lease space from them again. It's no different. The same adage holds in digital real estate. It's the same thing. Right. Gotcha. But that's, that's not necessarily something that everyone is doing. They're trying to, but typically what you find is, um, hey, I've got a tower over here, call Verizon, get yourself a fiber to it, and uh, then call us back and let us know when you can go up. So my, my, my point with the question was, um, it seems like this is innovative thinking that you don't see everywhere in the business yet. Well, no, because nobody has the amount of infrastructure on a converged basis. I think we, we have a, we have a, you know, every day we wake up and compete with, against some amazing companies um, competing against Equinix and digital realty and Cyrus one and SBA American tower, crown castle unity. All these are great, great companies, great management teams, but the way they've been built is with a historic view that they have to dominate that one space. And, and for the last, you know, two to three decades, that has been an accurate bet. You know, you look at the tower business, for example, and you look at the strategy that Tom Bartlett's deploying in American tower, you know, Tom has been really clear that the macro site is the core to the network. And I would agree with Tom, Tom's smart and he comes from Verizon. And then he's saying, look, and for our growth, we're going to go chase international. Once again, he's been right. International has grown really well and X currency. That's been a strong play for American tower. Now back here in the U S which is where, you know, most investors really value their earnings the most is right here, right here at home. And here at home, what we're hearing from customers is their needs are changing. And so networks are changing. And you know this all too well. You ran one of the biggest and most important side act businesses for a long time. What's happening today is you don't just get a search ring anymore, Rich, right? It's not like, here's a polygon, go work it, go bring me back three candidates. That is like so 2000 and late thing, you know? Now it's like, okay, look, I have 26 polygons, uh, my standard deviation is like 500 yards and, you know, and I need 14, 18 strands of fiber. And oh, by the way, I need, you know, I'm going to put RUs on top of all this. I don't care if it's a tower or if it's a utility pole, here are my cover specifications. And oh, by the way, you know, we're, we're front hauling this back and you've got to go find me, you know, a RAN hub where I'm going to have 3,500 square feet. And here's all my technical standards for my RAN hub. And oh, by the way, here's another list of technical standards for my cloud partner, who, by the way, is AWS, and you've got to create ecosystem for them. At this point, if you're a tower guy, your mind just goes, you know, your mind just blows because what you've just been handed is a mesh network that's going to interface and really ultimately deploy MIMO. And the only way you can deploy MIMO is with multiple, as you know, multiple radio access point networks, whether it's a small cell node, a Wi-Fi offload, a macro site whatever it is, it's all coming back to one point of aggregation. And that point of aggregation is called decentralized RAN. The radio access network is now being decentralized. Right. We're not building $250 million Ericsson switches anymore. Those days are, you know, back in the go-go days when you and I were building 2G and 3G, but that's just not happening anymore. Right. The infrastructure is lighter. It's more nimble. And the ability to design and proliferate those networks just requires a totally different abacus than what we were dealing with before. And so that's where we're going. Like you see all the work we're doing on the edge computing side. You see all the work we're doing on the small cell infrastructure side. You see the amount of fiber we just bought with Zayo. You know, we're prepping ourselves for a different kind of battle. And, and we're gonna play the game very differently than we played it before. That's my bet. Now, my bet is obviously colored by 26 years of thinking and observing and making tons of mistakes and losing and zoning hearings and having towers fall <laughs> over and construction and, you know, everything that could go wrong in building a network, I've seen it. And every bone in my body screams right now that the, the, the feeling I have here is that networks are changing, customers are changing, what they need is changing. 
And I don't know if our industry is adapting fast enough, which is why you see carriers doing more self-performing than ever around their 5G architecture. So, but look, we're, we're, we're in that mix. We're, we're doing all the things that we say we're doing. Time will tell if I'm right. I, I, I would urge everyone on this, on this video conference today, look, towers are still great. You know, American Tower is not going to go out of business because they whiffed on CRAM. Um, you know, Equinix isn't going to, you know, isn't going to go out of business because they, they missed on edge computing. I mean, all these are great, great multi-billion dollar well-run companies that are built for the future. But the growth, the good growth, that high single digit, low double digit growth is in a different place now. And if, right. and if you want to go chase that, you got to go this way. Right. You know, so if you want to chase three to 4% growth, you go that way, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so our friends at Crown have a partial Mark Ganzi philosophy of towers and Jay Brown and I have a very similar philosophy. <laughs> so <laughs> I like Jay. Getting, we get along really well. He's a good guy. They're getting the crap beat out of them yeah. for the fiber assets they have, yet you're being looked at as a genius in this score. Is it because you've got the other two pieces? Is it because the the fiber assets that you've got are more uh, uh, um, profitable or more robust than theirs? Or what do you think the difference is there between the two philosophies or the two reasons well, for being? Well, first of all, I had the pleasure of being gifted with like a $1.50 or $1.60 stock. I could only go anywhere but up. Uh, Jay was gifted with a very, very expensive stock that um, he's had to defend. And so Jay's job is absolutely as difficult as my job, I'd say Jay's job today is a little more difficult than my job. But here's what's happening. I think for Crown, it's it's really just storytelling. And, you know, now they're starting to give a lot more disclosure around their fiber business. At the end of the day, what a lot of people don't understand, Rich, is unlike Towers, fiber actually has multiple different types of businesses. There are many business models inside of fiber. You know this. And so, you know, you can, you can, you can go invest in infrastructure, which is the part that Jay loves, which is long-term leases, long haul, um, metro rings, fiber to the tower, uh, fiber to the node. Those four verticals are performing really well for Crown. They're having a lot of success in their long haul routes, their metro rings, and their FTT uh, business, fiber to the tower business, and their small cell business. Where Crown has gotten a little bit sideways is their enterprise business. So enterprise fiber is super competitive. And I tell this to everybody, you know, it's, it's really hard to be successful in enterprise fiber because there's no privacy of having that great zone tower where like you're, you're driving down the Garden State Parkway and there's this that one pine tree that you got zoned that nobody else could get zoned. Right. Well, you know how that ends. It ends up with four rad centers and a tower that's doing 180,000 of cash flow, right? Where look, you go run fiber down the middle of Paramus and there's going to be four or five guys running down that conduit. And so if I've got a hundred thousand square foot office building and I got a curb cut with, with five fiber providers, crown being one of them, that's a, that's just a race to the bottom, right? You're pricing circuits, you're pricing wavelengths, you're pricing dark fiber and it's brutally competitive. And I think that's the part of the business that I don't want to say crown underestimated or overestimated, call it what you want. But from day one, they should have been like, okay, we have this other business. It's not like towers. Let's explain it to you. It's going to have 60 to hundred basis points of churn every month, but here's the good news. We're growing it at 14 to 15%. So it's a nice little net three to 4% growth business. And if they would have just disclosed that and pushed it over to the left really fast and kept their, you know, what I call their wholesale fiber business in one lane, reported small cells in the third lane and then towers in the fourth lane, they'd not have a problem. But now they're having to unwind that and tell the story a little bit differently. The reality is it's a great, great management team, great set of assets. They're going to figure out how to tell the story because it was the same problem with Zayo. The reason we were able to buy Zayo at the right price was they had a messaging problem, you know, trying to communicate to public investors what fiber is, is hard because saying that you're just going to take fiber and turn it on its side and it's a tower on its side. I remember my good friend, Jennifer Fritchie at Wells Fargo used to say, it's just a tower, a tower on, its, on side. its side. It's not. Right. Here's why it's not a tower on its side. Permitting, strategic moat, right? 
privacy of conduits, you know, curb cuts, access to buildings. Telecom Reform Act of 1996, you and I are old enough to have been around for that, that leveled the playing field. That was equal access to all property owners, right. right. non-discriminatory access curb cuts to the MPO. And once that happened, building owners couldn't keep people out of their out of their MPO. You had to let everyone into the minimum point of entry. Now, what you did inside your riser is up to you, but you had to provide open access for everybody. So that's created kind of a free-for-all in enterprise. And I, I could spend a lot of time talking about fiber because I've spent the last two and a half years buying Zayo and I'm on that board and I spend probably, you know, three to four hours a week just on Zayo stuff. And every week I learn more about the fiber business. It's a super interesting business and we're going to do really well with Zayo. Um, and some people may not do well with some of their fiber assets if they paid 28 or 30 times, like we've seen some of these multiples go to. Yeah. But the fiber business is hard. You got to wake up and you got to fight every day. Right. So you met, mentioned enterprise. And that's a really good point because most of the audience here are enterprise real estate companies that are listening in. But one of the interesting things about that is that um, you've got some assets on the enterprise real estate piece. You mentioned just the, before medical. So there's, there's no way that anyone could come to you and say, listen, Mark, I know you're talking about digital assets and, and that's all well and good. And you've got a nice pocket of business with that, but don't get rid of the, the medical enterprise business. Keep that because that's going to do well for you. But you know, it, it, you probably with what's going on right now, a medical is probably at the top of the heap of, of the best real estate there is at the moment. Um, what's your thought on that? Could anyone convince you that the, the medical real estate might be worth hanging on to at this point? Well, look, I, I'm really fortunate that we owned medical real estate in the pandemic because um, we'll actually do almost close to the same AFFO we did last year pre-pandemic in 2019 was a great year for all real estate. Um, and look, uh, we, we have a really good performing portfolio. Uh, our MOBs held up, our triple net hospitals have held up really well. Our skilled nursing portfolio has had a resurgence because of you know, federal funding and, 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 and COVID has really helped us out there. Senior living, we've got a big chunk of senior living that's been hit pretty hard as you can imagine. So I never wanna say never, but I, I just always tell investors the same thing we have a track record of 30 years of creating value in digital and that track record. I can't talk about returns because I'll violate sec rules as a public company CEO, but those returns are really good. Um, we've had, you know, between my partners and myself, we've had close to 13 exits in digital over the last 26 years. And the returns are just vastly superior to what I could achieve in medical today. So, you know, the good news is we, we, we pulled through the pandemic. We managed it really well. I got a great partner, Rich Welch, who runs that business for me, um, ex-Goldman guy, very smart. And we're now in a position where we'll turn into 2021 and we're starting to see opportunistic real estate funds, pension funds, infrastructure investors all want to own these assets. So now we have a hot asset, similar to like last year in November when we announced we were selling our industrial portfolio to Blackstone. Everybody wanted to be in, in industrial real estate, logistics, right? Great business to be in in digital. So we sold our, our logistics business to Blackstone and we we're happy to part with it. Could we have held it and made more money? Maybe, I don't know. Could we have gotten a tighter cap rate this year? Maybe, I don't know. But ultimately you never look backwards, right? You make a decision, you stick with it. And for us, it's actually worked out really well. The, the, the various real estate assets that we've exited Look, we exited industrial last year. I exited all of our European office portfolio last year. We got rid of that to, to access the insurance company. We sold all of our community shopping centers anchored by Albertsons to Goldman Sachs. That's actually performed pretty well in the pandemic, community shopping centers. But look, Goldman paid us the right price and we were happy to part with it. The best trade was January. Um, we sold out a New York City office space. Like how lucky were we? We sold our position in RxR Realty. Love Scott Reckler. He's a great guy. He's, he was an amazing partner to Colony. But we, we had someone who was interested in buying, you know, our piece of the GP and our stake. And they gave us fair value. And we said, look, long term, we don't want to own office buildings in New York City. It's just not consistent with our digital strategy long term. 
and that ended up being a really good call. Um, so we've, we've harvested these assets, Rich, at a very good cadence. Not too fast, not too slow, but enough where every quarter we're selling a couple of things, we give it the right attention, we find the right buyers, and we extract the right result. And so far, it's worked out really well. I've been here almost six quarters now at Colony, and I can say everything that we've sold, we've sold at or above, at or above our NAV, our net asset value on balance sheet. Gotcha. So um, how much of the digital strategy that you're looking at revolves around 5G in one way or the other? Is it all of it? Some of it? No. None of it? Definitely not all of it. I would say, you know, as we, as we think about the spend, you know, this year, there'll be about a $378 billion TAM in digital spend. And two, $211 billion of that will be fiber. That has very, you know, some of that has to do with 5G, yes. But a lot of that just has to be bringing broadband to homes in COVID. So big overweight to fiber to the home, big overweight fiber to the whatever, data center, tower, you name it, and then fiber to the enterprise. So fiber is not necessarily a 5G catalyst. Fiber is really just the connective tissue that brings it all together. So we look at that, we say that's a pretty big spend. Now, look, towers and small cells, that's probably about an $80 billion TAM this year in terms of what was spent. And then the rest of that is another, you know, call it another, you know, 70 to 80 billion in data center. Now, in data center spend, everything we're doing right now is oriented to cloud. So most of the growth, as you could imagine, Rich, is based on cloud computing, um, rotation of public cloud, rotation of private cloud, um, enterprise workload shifting. IOT workloads shifting, and then we're, we're doing quite a bit with AI. So we've got a lot of uh, AI workloads with NVIDIA, a bunch of teaching universities like Carnegie Mellon and Georgia Tech, where we've got data centers on their campuses. And so that's a big, and, and so that's what we call big compute because those, those types of compute loads are just big power, you know, big power density generators. And you've just got to really, um, have a very uh, sophisticated facility to deal with those AI guys, particularly NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a, a big customer of ours. Really interesting. So one of the things that we're doing here at this event is we're talking a lot about prop tech, property technology. Yeah. Um, in your mind, is prop tech part of the digital infrastructure piece that, you know, focusing on focus that you might want to own, that you might be interested in, in as a digital real estate piece? Or is that sort of um, a near neighbor business that you're really not interested in? Well, we are looking at it. Um, we've actually been looking at PropTech at Colony now for almost five years. It's actually how our conversation started with Tom Barrick is he was an investor in some of our smaller private companies. He said, what do you guys think about PropTech? You know, what do you think about digital and real estate sort of coming together? And so I, I flew out and I met with Tom in LA a couple of years ago, just going back four or five years ago before we started our first fund. And that's actually how we started talking was disruption in traditional real estate models. How do we think about prop tech? How do we think about how digital is disrupting real estate? What are the, what are the models that are really accelerating that disruption? And obviously, look, it was easy, right? Retail was the first place to start. That was the most disrupted. I still think, you know, um, I think hospitality and lodging is being very disrupted by digital, certainly more disrupted by the pandemic. But, you know, lodging was already being, travel and leisure was already being disrupted by digital just because there's more efficient models for, you know, other, you know, beds that are quote unquote unoccupied. How do you release unoccupied inventory? Um, certainly, you know, the office market was being slightly disrupted. I don't think digital was really disrupting office markets. I think now post COVID it will because we're all realizing a couple days a week we can work from home and we can be just as productive. Um, I'm working from home today and I'm certainly, I've had a busy day. I was up at five and this is about my 13th meeting of the day. So, you know, I think that that intersection and that continued collision between real estate and, and, and telecom is what you and I used to call it, you know, wherever that stuff intersects, there's opportunity. That's why I got in the business in 1994. It was a simple premise, which is, gee, wireless companies need real estate. I have great relationships with real estate owners. I understand real estate. 
what if we smash those together and created an idea? And any entrepreneur, anyone that's watching today, I would encourage you, if you have any business model that is at the crossroads of where real estate meets digital or telecom, you're going to be successful because those business models have endured the good ones. Yep. So, yeah, well, that's a good topic for us to continue to talk about after this, because we are really steeped in the prop tech space now. And we see a lot of interesting things coming up. Um, you know, we, we hear from the real estate guys and what they're putting in and what they like and, and they use. And we're hearing from these prop tech companies that come either from they raised $12 million in, uh, in a money and or they came out of their parents' basement with some great idea. So, you know, there's a lot there. I so, love those ideas. I love the yeah, parents' exactly. basement. Exactly. So I read somewhere there was an interview with somebody recently um, that said that you had uh, 31 deals in the pipeline. Um, that sounds like a lot, even for, you know, a big company like Colony and, and you know, even with a team like yours. Um, is that a sort of an accurate number or there, you know, is that sort of a, a rounding error here? How do you view the fact that you're going to try and close that many deals over time? Well, look, we, we, we look at our first fund as sort of as a predictor of what we think we can do in the future. We, um, you know, we, we looked at 270 deals in fund one. Oh. We did 17 of them. So, you know, our, our hit rate was, you know, somewhere below 10%. Now, we, we, we're very good at vetting stuff. And, and, you know, one of the things that I say in investment committee every week is it's better to get to a quick no than a prolonged maybe. Prolonged maybes kill you because you waste time, you waste due diligence dollars. And so we've gotten really efficient at knowing what works and what doesn't work. And so, you know, on that basis, um, out of the 31 deals that, you know, are in our pipeline right now, um, we'll do five right now. Two are already closed three are in exclusivity. And so we'll be busy. We'll deploy another billion dollars of equity in the fourth quarter, either committed capital or actual capital out the door. Um, we're not seeing a shortage of good ideas. I think there continues to be a lot of good ideas because candidly, this, this planet is not ready for 5G. It's not ready for edge computing. It's not ready for cloud. It's not ready for AI. It's not ready for gaming. It's not ready for IoT networks. There's so many things happening today, Rich. It's really exciting. I mean, usually you and I'd sit down together and say, wow, I'm really excited about deploying LTE. And that was kind of the one big theme. Right now, there's so many different themes right. that you can plug into and play. So all of us that are participating in this Zoom call today, most of us are you know, running a business or running a building or a portfolio. There's a lot to do right now. Um, and it's, it, I'm optimistic. It's a pretty exciting time right now. Gotcha. Well, Mark, thank you. I've, I, I, you know, I always love having these discussions, <clears throat> excuse me, because again, we come from the same place and you are just killing it with what you're doing now at Colony. And I'm so pleased that we're friends. Um, but thank you for doing we're this. We're just like two guys having a beer, Rich. Nothing's <laughs> exactly. strange, buddy. Exactly. And that's why I love doing these things. But thank you to Ceci from your team uh, for putting this together. And thank you for being with us. I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. We're going to Go up after this panel is over. We're going to go up to our rooftop. We're doing this in a virtual platform. To your point, Mark, where, you know, the world is changing. We have to change with it. We're using a digital platform that's interactive. So we're all going to go up to the rooftop for a little while. And then we're going to um, spend some time talking with Darlene Pope, who is our event chair. And from there, we're going to go to the, uh, the uh, exhibit Darlene hall. Is, uh, Darlene's and good And see people. all our folks. So, um, Mark, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Um, and thank you for being a friend. And we'll talk really soon. Thanks, Rich. And thanks to Darlene Pope. She's been a great evangelist of, uh, of, of telecom and digital real estate. And uh, the, the industry needs more people like Darlene. So I, I thank agree. you for sharing, Darlene. Appreciate it. Yep. Excellent. Mark, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Be well, Rich. You Take too. Take care. Bye. Thanks.